Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Choices, Finding Your Joy. Paula Vale here. I am so happy today to be sharing the show with an amazing guest. I have with us today Michelle Kennedy. She is the author of Don't Pee in the Wet Suit. This was released in 2016. She is a contributor to the Huff Post, Elephant Journal, and Tiny Buddha. Her essays focus on dealing with loss, self-compassion, body image, sobriety, and moving through trauma. She teaches in the Communication Suites Department at the University of San Diego. She is a former television news reporter and anchor at KRON4. I just think that's so fun. Uh, <laughs> in San Francisco. That is so cool. She shot, wrote, edited, and presented stories live from multiple newscasts. Oh my gosh, the stories you must have, Michelle. I could spend <laughs> two hours with you. I do. I have many, many stories. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. I'm happy to be here. You're so welcome. I am honored to have you on the show. You are just amazing. Thank well, I, I think just uh, let's start with a little more of your fascinating background and how that kind of progressed you into where, where you're at now. Yeah, I worked in television news for a whopping 11 years. And, you know, a lot of the writing that I'm working on now is getting into why did I choose a career like that? Uh, and it's a lot of what I teach now is the positives and negatives of working in media. But, uh, you know, as a young person, I really, um, you know, wanted to be seen um, and validated and known and at times grew up in more chaotic environments. And I think that's not an uncommon theme for a young person to seek that. And I always loved to perform and kind of make everybody laugh. And it was a lot about being kind of a people pleaser and I'm gonna make everybody laugh and maybe uh, ease tense situations when they came up. Yeah. And so performing really bled into that. And so I wanted to tell stories, I wanted to perform, but I also thought that honestly, if I was on TV, then I would be something, be somebody. And so, yeah, I worked in that field for many years. And as you can imagine, it was so incredibly stressful uh, and hard. <laughs> And it's even harder today with uh, young people getting in and not only having to create stories, shoot them themselves, edit them themselves, but update all the social media channels. So it's tough. Uh, at the same time, it was a lot of fun. I tell my students I don't regret one minute of it because I got to see things and tell stories and meet incredible people. And so that was such a big part of my journey and my path. But at the heart of it, I really always wanted to write. I wanted to tell the stories of the things that I was learning about myself, relating to myself, relating to other people, um, you know, positive stories and, and growth. And I wanted to figure out a way to write those things. Um, and that's kind of what finally propelled me into being brave enough to do the writing. I love it. I love it. So what triggered you, tell us about your book, to, to give that title to your book. <laughs> Don't pee in the wetsuit. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I wrote that book uh, about 10 years ago and I was traveling around the world with a best friend. We had both quit our jobs. I finally quit my job in broadcasting. She was taking a break from being a lawyer and we were going to write a book about travel and then when I sat down to write, all this stuff came out about my dad and um, grief that I hadn't really dealt with. My father had died about nine years prior. And uh, as a television news reporter at the time in Northern California, I almost got sent to cover the car accident that he died in before I knew he was in it. And so it was this like terrible, I know, it's just this like story that's like, ugh. Um, I saw another live shot from another station and the reporter said, 
a 50 year old duck hunter from this small town died in the crash and there's ducks all over the freeway. And I just had this intuition, like that's my father. We didn't know the name yet because they couldn't notify next to Ken because at the time we didn't really have cell phones yet. So the CHP couldn't find any of us. So I was right about that. And it just was this crazy thing of like covering the news for, for years and years and then being a part of it and seeing my dad's picture on the news and that was a turning point for me of really not being sure I wanted to even do that anymore but I was so attached and my ego was so attached to being on the news and I didn't know what else I would do so it took many years for me to finally find the courage to say like I don't need this anymore I'm okay with leaping off of it but um, on that trip I wrote mostly um, ended up writing about my father and was able to get past the sensational nature of the accident and move into a very unfinished relationship with a guy that was very hard on me and who I never quite felt like I could please. And it was about trying to make peace with a relationship that you can't work on it with the other person. And that's hard. That's hard in life and death. I couldn't work on it because he was dead, but there are people that I realize in our lives that are alive that we will never be able to work on a relationship with them for various reasons. And it's really an inside job to get that peace or forgiveness or whatever it is that we need to do to feel better about that relationship. So that's what the book is about. It's about that grief. It's about finding that peaceful place. And it's a crazy romp through 11 countries with a best friend. So I tried to balance the funny craziness and the grief because I didn't really want it to be one or the other. It's definitely like this, which I guess is how life is, right? Yes. Oh, isn't it though? Yeah. Oh, gosh. And so tell us, so what are you, your main focus now, Michelle, mm -hmm. what are you doing? You know, uh, I started to, when I got back from traveling, I found the courage to start to write about, you know, these things that I was thinking about, grief, loss, control, um, you know, eventually sobriety, meditation, like I was starting to get brave enough about putting these stories out, the things that I thought about, the things that I had learned. And um, that was a really great thing because I was finding the courage to do that, but it was very much in baby steps because I was afraid the whole time, you know, mm -hmm. if I write about this, what if people make fun of me? What if they don't like it? I was so caught up in how will this be received? Yeah. And that's a part of my story too, is this people pleasing behavior, like to have people not like me and not agree with what I'm doing is like death. And so this, the, the baby steps that I took to start to put these articles out there uh, really came back to me in such a positive way because I also had this idea in my head that my father gave me when I was younger if you stand up for yourself, if you disagree, if you talk like that, which basically that meant disagreeing and having a strong opinion about anything. Um, no man will ever want to marry you. That's not desirable. And I, I believed that. I thought, well, you just don't stick out your opinion about something because like that's, that's too much. I don't want to be too much. And I, I just kept pushing through that. But it took me years because it was a story that I told myself that was not true. But by holding on to that story, I didn't have to be vulnerable. I didn't have to put myself out there to maybe get some grenades thrown at me. And so, you know, eventually I started to get such incredible responses, especially this one article that I posted on uh, a Huffington Post called Who Am I to Be Skinny? And it was a before picture when I was traveling and I was heavier and I didn't feel good about myself. I was drinking a lot. I was eating my way around the world. I was dealing with the worst pain, finally facing the grief and just stuffing, you know, just mm -hmm. picking out. I can't say that I really regret any of the picking out because I ate some of the best food of all time, you know, in all of these different countries. Yes, I know, man. But in this article, I was talking about this obsession with my body image and obsession with being smaller, being smaller, being smaller. And I, I challenged myself to put up the before picture that I could not stand of myself and, and, not, and resist the urge to do the after picture. Like, look, I lost some weight. And I remember I told somebody about it and she said, that's like a form of self-hate, putting that picture up. And I thought, oh, she doesn't get it. 
because I, I saw it as the complete opposite. I can finally yeah. love that woman yeah. and this woman and the woman that might gain six pounds after Thanksgiving. Like, can I love them all? Yes, we can love all of them. We can put compassion and love around all of those versions of ourselves. And so when I posted that article and I was so afraid of that picture where I felt like I was swollen and I don't even look happy in the picture. And um, so many people wrote to me and reached out and said, I get it, I understand. And it was like, it doesn't really matter what size we are. You can hate yourself mm -hmm. at your optimum weight. You know, it's an inside job. And so that's where I'm at right now is continuing to put out work like that. And the book that I'm working on now is about these kinds of themes. Like, what are we telling ourselves? I'm too, too, I'm not skinny enough to be loved in a relationship. I'm a bad artist because my seventh grade art teacher told me I was. What are we holding on to that we can break out of? Or even relationships, you know? I'm in some familial conflict with some family members. And I believed, and I know this is more of a cultural thing, that we have to be close to our family members. We just have to. Yes. And I'm realizing we don't. <laughs> we can detach with love. We have permission. And if that's what's best for us at that time, it's possible yes. to, to find that freedom. So yeah, I guess that's it. What I'm working on now is like swimming through and breaking out of these stories that I've been locked into that it has to be this way. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Michelle, that is just so spot on how really it's an inside job. Yeah. what we think of ourselves and loving ourselves. And we, you know, it's so easy to give that power and that control. Myself, in my book, I talk about where I got bullied in school. Mm. And then one day I decided, love me or don't. I'm yeah. going to be me and I'm going to be happy with me. It, but it is an inside job. And it's so yeah. easy for us. Oh, if I... If I were five pounds thinner, I'd look so good. Or, or if my words were better, you know, mm -hmm. like when I started doing my show five years ago, I was like, well, I'm not, you know, the best speaker. And or maybe I, I should people. go to maybe I should go to Toastmasters and then learn and, to speak better, and yeah, then I'll do it. I'm just gonna be me, and <laughs> I've just fallen in love with it. And there you go. But you are so right; it is an inside job. Good for you. That's amazing. And it's, you know, I just, when you were saying that and congrats on the book and the podcast and all of your growth over the years, it's so inspiring. And it, I tell my students this, like I had a student who was talking about a passion that he gave up because his parents wanted him to go to college. And I was just listening and I he said, you know, it's dumb. I wasn't making any money and I, I, people were going to think it's dumb. And I said, is there any person doing the passion or the art or the stand up comedy that you look at and then you say about them like that's dumb? And he said, No, I, I'm like, geez, that's brave. I can't believe they're doing that. And yet we think that about ourselves that if we do the thing that most of the people are going to say, Oh, they're terrible at that, or how silly that they would follow that passion. Some people will, there are always going to be haters. But most people are going to say, oh, well, if she could do that, maybe I can. Yes. You know? Yes. So that I think that's incredible. So true. And, and you've published so many articles. Tell us about a few of those. What, tell us some of your favorites or, or what you really put your heart into and, and really felt an effect. You know, I wrote one that pops to mind uh, that I wrote when I was in Nicaragua. Gosh, was it two Januarys ago? I guess it was. Time flies. And uh, I had been sober for many years and never wrote about it. And there was still a sense of shame around it. And there was still a sense of being afraid that people would think something, you know, same theme. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I was sitting there and drinking some coffee and staring at the beach at this beautiful place I was staying at. And I just started writing about it and I thought, okay, I'm ready now. And Liz Gilbert has a great TED talk where she talks about the concept of kind of something coming over us 
and helping us with our creativity and opening up to the flow of that. And I didn't really get what she was talking about until I listened to it more. But I believe that because, and I'm sure you've experienced this, that sometimes we sit down to write and then we look at three pages we wrote and say, what in the heck, where did that come from? <laughs> yeah. I don't know how I thought of that. I don't know why that story came to my brain today, but yeah. man, that makes sense. Wow, I'm super excited because I don't know what just happened. So I believe that. So when I was sitting there writing this sobriety story, I was reading and going, oh my God, I didn't know I had all this. I guess this is what I wanted to talk about. And that one, that was incredible. I met so many people uh, as a result of that, that piece. I had another woman ask me to be on her podcast and all these people writing from all over the world in different parts of their, you know, sobriety or being curious about it journey. And just kind of like wanted to be heard, you know, so I don't really like to offer advice, maybe like tell about stuff that worked for me, mm -hmm. but I just, I think they just wanted to be heard or, you know, kind of get support and so I'd write back and yeah, I get that. Here's something else that happened to me. And so it's that connection that I got from that article in particular, dozens and dozens of emails. I still get them and it was published a long time ago. Um, and so that was a really beautiful experience, um, to be able to connect like that. So I think it was the, the body image one and the sobriety one are the ones that I was like, wow, this is so awesome. And so, um, yeah, those ones were really cool. I just published one on tiny Buddha, which I love tiny Buddha. So I was so grateful, you know, that I, that I got to put a piece on there, but it was about two minute meditations and just. I think this year I'm really in this, this mode of, um, quitting, not quitting because it's super hard, but, um, relaxing a little bit on this concept of being a human doing. And I am, I am valued by everything that I'm doing and look how much I'm doing. And I read somewhere yesterday where it said, um, somebody posted about that behavior is oftentimes a, a trauma response. And it's response to really, if I slow down, how will I feel about what I'm not dealing with? And who am I if I'm not doing all these things? Because is this person alone enough? And so I'm trying to incorporate that into more self-care, more self-compassion and realizing that it doesn't serve me if I say like, well, if I can't meditate for 30 minutes today, then I shouldn't do it. You know, like, what is that? You know, so if we can just do two minutes or one minute or three deep breaths before we get out of bed, that's better than nothing. At yes. least we're being still for a moment and we can get in touch maybe a tiny, tiny bit. And so uh, that's what, that was my most recent one. And I don't know what I'm going to write about next. I'm kind of deep in the new, the new kind of book and I don't know, but the, the articles come to me in weird times and then I bang them out. It's never anything that takes a long time. It like comes when I'm on a hike or in the shower and I'm like, oh, and then I, I it's weird. It. It's really weird. I love it. And you know, like your article about sobriety and so many people reaching out, just you sharing that really told so many people, you know, help them with, I'm not alone she shared and you know it made it gave them hope it did thank you thank you and that it, is it, really beautiful and and i love the little two minute meditation if you can't do and really that's true sometimes some mornings i can give myself two or three minutes to just you know do the affirmations and, and then off you go it's so easy when we are busy 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 and always have a you know, to achieve this and this and this, to say, okay, I want to chill a while and just love me. You can have, you can feel guilty about that. Oh yeah. Yeah. You get into it and then you, you're, I will think, oh, you know, yeah. Immediately get that guilt or feel weird, um, about relaxing or even reading a book. And I'm thinking, you're reading a book. It's okay to read a book, but I, it's these stories that I tell myself that it's not enough. And even if I accomplished 10 things on the list, 
and then I read the book, I still feel like, well, you could be doing something in these last 40 minutes of the day. Like, it's ridiculous, you know, and it only hurts me and creates stress. But that's a constant practice because especially working in news that was so hectic and stressful in and of itself um, and to be doing all day and running around. And even though I've been out of that for years and teaching, there have been times when I take on classes at three different schools and I'm teaching like 10 classes in a semester. It's absurd. And then I say, no, 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 I can do it. I'm going to save a bunch of money, but it's, it's insane. And it hurts me. So I'm really trying to like, stop doing that and simplify. And when I feel myself saying yes to 15 things, remembering like, no, 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 no. You got to say no here and don't feel guilty about it, you know? And it's so easy for us to get caught up in that. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Especially I think creative types, because we want to keep creating Mm -hmm. (laughs) in all these ways. And all those great ideas that come to you. And that's Mm -hmm. funny because that's how it was when I was writing my book. I'd be in the car on the way to me. Oh, I want to talk about that. You know, (laughs) it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think we're lucky to have this awareness and to be able to have conversations like this and work on these things. And that's what I always think of. I mean, even with sobriety in the the early time of just not being able to break away from that idea that maybe something was wrong with me or, Mm -hmm. you know, I, and that's what I talk about in that one piece. Um, it, it, it's like drinking looks so different for every person. And my, one of my main points in that was if it's hurting your life and you're reading this and trying to glean something from it because it's hurting your life, that probably is enough to think about letting it go. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. We don't even have to get into like, am I an alcoholic? Am I not? This is my opinion, mm-hmm. obviously, from my experience. But when I was able to let that go and say, If anything else in my life was causing this much trouble, this much embarrassing situations, I would work really hard to let it go. And so that was kind of all that I needed. And the people that I've met and the work that I've done with a clear head is is so helpful for me and has calmed me and helped me live such a more fulfilling life Um, like I would never trade it. And I feel so grateful that I get to have these tools and this knowledge. And I see people suffering who will never get that knowledge because it's hard to do the work. It's hard to look in the mirror. It's not fun, especially in the beginning. God, it's terrible. But the other side of it is more contentment. And so I'm so grateful that for some reason, I got the opportunity to dive in and I took it. Um, so yeah, I just, that's, I'm feeling gratitude just talking to you about these things because we are lucky. Michelle, you are such an inspiration. You do. Thank you. You are. Oh my gosh. I love it. Will you take a moment and share any website or information that you'd like with everyone? I know they're going to be excited to, to know more about you and read your book. Oh, I'd love for them to check out my website. It's M Kennedy Writer. So M K E N N E D Y W R I T E R dot com. And it's got um, all of my articles on there and some television interviews that I've done around these subjects and the book. Uh, and hopefully soon, not hopefully, for sure soon, there will be another book when I can formulate that and finish it. But yeah, I'm just kind of in that process now. So yeah, I'm kennedywriter.com. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, with, with the last few minutes of the show, what do you want everyone to think about today? What do you want to share? I would love for everyone to think about today. What stories are you telling yourself that are uh, stories that tell you you can't? what are you holding on to and saying, well, I can't do this because of this. And to challenge those ideas because some of them may be true, but I have found uh, that most of them are not. And there is usually a reason why we're holding on to them. 
why is this story that I'm telling myself that tells me I can't do this thing that I actually really think I want to do, um, you know, why, why and how is that serving me in some way? And for me, most of the stories that I tell myself and that I've told myself over the years that hold me back or tell me that I can't, um, they keep me from being vulnerable. They keep me from putting myself out there as an easy target. And as I've broken through that, I've just found so much more joy and connection. And the couple of people that maybe don't like what I'm doing, think I'm full of it, um, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, it, it, what matters is the way that I feel and the connections that I can have through doing the work and the writing. And again, letting go of these stories. So. I think that if we challenge ourselves and think about even maybe one thing today, um, one of those stories and, and maybe kind of figuring out if that's not true, that can be a, a really positive thing. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Well, I, I know that, that you've made me think about I'm going to think about one of my personal stories. I was going to ask you, can you share or is it just kind of inside right now? <laughs> a step I've had to take in my life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Cause we do, we do have to take those steps mm -hmm. and share things. And I, there were, there were times I was uh, 27 years in a restaurant and then bought it and there were times that had to have been so stressful. Oh, a female entrepreneur mm -hmm. running a you know restaurant that sat 200 people. I wow. dealt with a few things. Um, mm -hmm. There was no. Uh, it, it was interesting, but uh, one of the most rewarding things was, you know, the love of my customers and, and loving my employees, even though I did go through things. But I, I really had to step out and be strong a few times and say, no, you're not going to treat me that way or that's not mm -hmm. going to happen and stand up for, for people. So, yeah. And we, we all have those times in our lives. Mm -hmm. you know, when we, and even if it's taken a step for ourselves and saying, okay, I need to make a change here and doing it. Mm -hmm. it and I think too, it's difficult if you don't have practice with it, just that simple standing up for ourselves, setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's taken me so long to do that and it's still hard, yes. but to be able to do that makes such a difference in the way that you move through the world and your relationships with people and yourself. Because when you set the boundary, you might feel weird, guilty, scared, but ultimately most of the time, when some hours pass, you think, huh, I did that, you yeah. know? I did it, I'm an advocate for myself. I set a boundary and right. really that sets us free, doesn't it, Michelle? No. Oh. <laughs> what, a, what a great, way to end the show yeah well thank you for having me and congrats on your thank book you and so much everything you're doing is such an inspiration and it, keep, keep it up thank you and you as well thank you for all the lives that you touch thank you Paula. Love it. and when when your second book is finished i would love to have you on the show again deal i would love that oh well thank you love hugs and blessings to everyone out there love hugs and blessings Bye. Bye.